me. Between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. So think about it this way. First of all, Jeremiah 11 says, Israel is an olive tree. Ephesians 2 says, you who were once far off have now been brought near. You've been made fellow citizens with the household of God. Romans 11 talks about being grafted in. It says what? There's two olive trees. Okay? Two olive trees. The wild olive tree gets grafted back into the cultivated olive tree. Substitute the correct word in Jeremiah 11. It's cultivated back into Israel. So these Gentiles actually are no longer Gentiles. Do you realize, viewer, that, that the word Gentile means out of covenant? So if you consider yourself a Gentile Christian, what you're really saying is you're an out of covenant Christian, and that's an oxymoron. You can't have that. Uh, either you are in covenant and you're part of the Messiah, or you're out of covenant and you will spend eternity away from him. So what we're having here is that Paul has, is not having a brilliant stroke of genius. He is literally quoting the Old Testament, and he is saying, listen, all of those who were sent to the four corners of the earth, you are now allowed to come back home. The Gentiles are allowed to be part of Israel. That's why he says, you are now fellow citizens of Israel. You are Israelite heritage, and you now have access to the covenants. He doesn't say covenant as if there's only one covenant called the New Covenant. Middle Eastern covenants layer on one another. In Greek, in our Western Christian mindset, we think old is gone away, new is new. We cannot combine the two. We don't understand how Middle Eastern covenants work. They are transparencies that reveal they never go away. Simply reveal a bigger part of the picture. This is critical to understand that you become a citizen of Israel and become subject to her covenants of promise. Ladies and gentlemen, you are Israel. You are not a, 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 a Baptist, a Methodist. There's no Lutheran line uh, or, or non-denominational line on Judgment Day at the resurrection. Either there is a line for Israelites, the chosen people, or there's a line for Gentiles, pagans, those that do not know Yeshua as Messiah. There is, it doesn't even matter if you have Jewish blood. Either you are part of Israel and you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you are following Yeshua the Messiah, you do not, you see. That's why Paul says that it doesn't matter if you're even born a Jew. It matters if you are a Jew in your heart, if you are truly following him through obedience in the Messiah. And why is this so critical to understand? Why did I just go through all of that to determine who's Israel? Because if you recognize who you are, that you are Israel, then it makes way more sense and it's more relevant to continue our study uh, today because the Sabbath was given to Israel. And it says it was given for all eternity. So now we have dis, uh, completely dispelled myth number two that it was only given to the Jews because it wasn't. It was given to all Israel. And now we understand that it was given to anyone who is calling themselves a child of God which is anyone that believes in the Messiah, you are grafted in, according to Romans chapter 11. Jeremiah 3131. 31. This is the new covenant chapter of all the Bible. It says this. It says, Behold, the days come, says Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now think about this for a moment. I want to ask you a question for all of you viewers out there that believe that... that that, that God made a covenant with the Gentile Christians. Can you please show me in Jeremiah chapter 31 where it says that he is going to make a covenant with the Gentiles? Never. It doesn't say it one single time. Not even in the New Testament does it say that there is going to be a covenant with the Gentiles. There is one people of God, ladies and gentlemen, and it is the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, and it is the house of Israel southern kingdom, which split under King Solomon, which at some point he will bring back and make all Israel one again. And he says that he is going to make a new covenant with one people, and he calls them the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So you must be one of those two kingdoms, or you cannot be the new covenant. The new covenant is completely illegitimate. It's a moot point for you if you do not consider yourself Israel, 
then you have no covenant, there is no new covenant, and there is no blood for your sins, and you, are st you will die in your sins uh, on judgment day. Myth number two. The Christian Sabbath is Sunday. Well, let's walk right into this. The Roman Emperor Constantine said this about Sunday. On March 7, 321 A.D., he passed his famous national Sunday law, and I quote, Let all judges and townspeople and occupations of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. I could literally go on for several more slides quoting uh, uh, quoting. Uh, Constantine, he says in other places that if anybody is caught resting on what he calls the Jewish Sabbath, see how it got messed up all the way back then, because he's a Gentile and he hated the Jews, that if anyone's caught resting on the Jewish Sabbath, which was Saturday, the seventh day, they would be excommunicated from the church or killed if they didn't stop. The Catholics completely admit the change. Of course, these two old quotations are uh, exactly correct. By the way, this is coming from This Rock. The magazine of Catholic Apologetics in 1997 says this. Of course, these two old quotations are exactly correct. The Catholic Church designated Sunday as the day for corporate worship and gets full credit or blame for that change. They also says this. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did, the Catholic Church that is, happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. The day of the Lord was chosen, not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. Right here, we are seeing quotes from the Catholic Church admitting that they changed the day. Let's continue. Another one. This is from Centennial Pastor Page, St. Catherine Catholic Church in Michigan in 1985, says, the day of resurrection, the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, came on the first day of the week. So this would be the new Sabbath. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. They are admitting, and they go on to say, that anyone that keeps, anyone that calls Sunday, the first day of the week, the Sabbath, actually falls under the jurisdiction of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. So we see right here that they even admit that the only logical people that are consistent with the Sabbath, if you're going to be uh, called a Sabbatarian, uh, they say that you should be a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. I'm not advocating that you become a Seventh-day Adventist, but I am advocating that we look heavily into the scriptures and uncover uh, th these, these w somebody put drapes over the windows when the light is supposed to be coming in. We need to open it back up and, and find out what's been concealed this whole time. Did they really change the Sabbath and turn it into Sunday when it used to be on Saturday? Do we have any evidence that Christians or early believers in Yeshua kept the Sabbath on the biblical day that's commanded on Saturday? And also one more quote says, The Roman Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine, infallible authority given to her by founder Yeshua, or Jesus Christ. The Protestant claiming that the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. Now, I would disagree with that because there are a lot of us out there that believe in the Saturday Sabbath, but that happens to be one of the most popular uh, denominations that are out there. Look at this. One of the most incredible quotes of all time that I have ever found on this subject is from Socrates Scotticus in the 5th century, says this. He's a church historian. For although almost all churches throughout did you hear that? All churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries of the Lord's Supper on the Sabbath every week. Yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. And another historian confirming this states, The people of Constantinople and almost everywhere assembled together on the Sabbath, as well as on the first day of the week which custom is never observed at Rome or at Alexandria. Did you hear what I just said, ladies and gentlemen? What these, what these historians are saying is that believers everywhere kept the Sabbath on the seventh day, 
they met that Saturday night, late into the evening. That's what Paul was doing when Eutychus fell out the window and he healed him. They met on the first day of the week as well sometimes. But nobody in Rome or Alexandria did that. So let me ask you a question that will really drive home my point. Who ended up ruling the world? Rome. It was Rome that made all of the decrees for the rest of mankind, uh, the known world at that time. It was Rome that made these changes. And so that's where, why we do what we do today is because of the decrees and the changes of the laws that happened so long ago. And we literally have never turned around. We've never audited ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to audit what we believe. Because we are human. We're mere men. And you give us enough time and just a little bit off, one half of a degree, 2,000 years becomes hundreds of miles. And that's what we're trying to do here at Passion for Truth Ministries is we're trying to get back to the truth. Because the truth can only do one thing. And what is that? Set us free. Myth number three. Yeshua does not tell us to keep the Sabbath. Well, we're going to find out if that's really true. Does Jesus really tell us not to keep the Sabbath? Does he really break the Sabbath? Does his disciples break the Sabbath? Do they keep the Sabbath on the seventh day? And if, if so, how did they do it? So let's get started. We see this all over the place. Over the last 10 or 15 years, this has been popular. WWJD. What would Jesus do? I remember even kids wearing bracelets with that. Uh, shirts that said, what would Jesus do? Posters, banners inside of what would Jesus do? Well, let's ask the question. What would, we, what would Yeshua actually do? Matter of fact, let's go beyond that. What did he do? What did he do? John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, keep my commandments. Yeshua is talking here. If you love me, keep my commandments. Matthew 23, 1 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law, the Pharisees, sit in Moses' seat. So before I go any further, let, let's, let's talk about this. John 14, 15 says this. Yeshua's talking. He says, if you love me, you will do exactly what I tell you to do. You will keep my commandments. Now the question is begging, which commandments? Well, let me ask you a question. If you believe that Jesus is God, and he is the word made flesh that created all of the heavens and the earth, then he wrote them all, ladies and gentlemen. He is the word. He wrote all of them. He could not have wrote some, and his father wrote some. He is the word. He is the Torah made flesh. He is the reason for the season, if you will. And he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now watch what the next commandment is very carefully. Matthew 23. Then Yeshua said to the crowds and to his disciples, which is the teachers of the law, and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, called the Bema seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Well, when I was in Israel, and for those of you that have been there, you've been to some of the ancient synagogues, and what you'll notice is there is a, there is a stone seat. It's a stone bench, and it's called the Bema seat, or the Moses' seat. And every Shabbat, one of the rabbis or one of the people that is part of the local assembly would read the Torah. That was the only thing that you were allowed to do when you sat in that seat was actually read. You were not allowed to commentate. You were not allowed to give your opinion. You were not allowed to preach. You were not allowed to add or take away from it. You literally only read the law and the prophets. When you stood up from that, you could commentate, you can argue, the rabbis would come together, they would give their opinion of it. That was fine. But when you're sitting in Moses' seat, you are only allowed to literally read the word of Yahweh. So what do we have here? We have first Yeshua saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and you'll do what I tell you to do. And secondly, what does he tell his disciples to do? To listen and do every single thing. Thing the Pharisees tell you to do from that seat. Why? Because when they're sitting in that seat, they're not commentating. They're telling you exactly what my father told you to do 1,200 years earlier. They're speaking the Torah and the prophets. And Yeshua, in a very clear but indirect way, because most of us as believers do not grow up even knowing what Moses' seat is, 
significance of it or what they did when they sat on it. But Yeshua is telling them very directly, I want you to do, hear and do the Torah. He's referring right back to the Shema. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, hear and do. Hear the Lord our God is one. He is a God. And you are to keep his commandments through faith and write them on your heart. He is making it very clear. And that's why I'm going over this over and over because I cannot stress the importance of this, that he's telling his disciples to do what the Pharisees say. And what do the Pharisees say? They quote the Torah. Matthew 19, verse 16 says this, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to them, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to them, which ones? Yeshua said, and he starts quoting the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not be all witness. Honor your father and mother. You shall, not love, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So here's what we have. we have. We have this rich man coming to Yeshua saying, listen, I want eternal life. I can see clearly that you're a miraculous person. How do I enter into eternal life? Yeshua says, keep my commandments. He does not say... Hey, by the way, uh, if you'll just raise your hand, come down to the front and invite me into your heart, then you will have an eternal life. He doesn't say that. He's the, he says the very same thing that his father said 1,200 years, 4,000 years earlier, keep my commandments and you will live. If you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you disobey me, you will die. It's the same message from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We just have to look at it the right way. And so the, the, the rich young ruler says, well, which one should I keep? Yeshua begins to walk through the commandments, and he interrupts him, and, and he says, man, I, I've kept all those. And Yeshua says, now go and sell everything that you own. And the young man walked away sad because he had many possessions. Why does he say that? Does he really intend for him to go sell everything? No. He is saying that the Father is only looking for one kind of worshiper, and is the worshiper that will worship in spirit and in truth. And that young man had the truth. He was keeping the truth, but he was not doing it through faith. And faith is what's required to make the truth come alive. His disciples honored the Sabbath after his death their entire lives. Jim, there's no way the disciples actually kept the Sabbath. Well, let's find out. In Luke 23, verse 56, it says this. And they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. But they, this is right after Yeshua died. But they rested on Shabbat. They rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. So here you have Mary and Martha, some of the disciples of Yeshua. They followed Yeshua. And I'd imagine the rest of the disciples are doing the exact same thing. They, are, they had to get them into the ground because the next day was the Sabbath. Now that particular day, uh, when, he, when he died, uh, the next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was a high Sabbath. And then you had Friday in between there. They bought the Spices on Friday, then they had to rest for the weekly Sabbath. Now, why would they be resting if they're not obeying the Sabbath? They are literally, after the death, they are obeying the Sabbath. And I'm going to suggest as we move through here, and you see many more times where it's alluded to that they actually kept the Sabbath, that they did not get the memo that Yeshua sent them saying the Sabbath was done away with because there was none. Corinthians 7.19 says this, Circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping the commandments of God is what counts. Do you hear what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying that, listen, he's talking about salvation, and there's a debate on whether you can be saved if you're circumcised. And this is the way that he would have said it, the context. Circumcision means nothing, uncircumcision means nothing. Both of you guys are wrong. Neither one of them are required for salvation. What really matters is keeping the commandments of Yahweh through faith. The same message that Yeshua gave, the same message that Yahweh gave on Mount Sinai, and the same message that he gave to Adam in the garden. Continuity, God never changes. He always remains the same. Paul says in Romans 3.31, Do we then nullify the law by this faith, the faith of Yeshua? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So we have Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, telling us that he upholds the law. Let me ask a, a, a question, maybe even a bit of a sarcastic question. Is, would any 
anyone remotely insinuate that when he says that he upholded the law, that he is not referring to the Sabbath as being part of that law when it's the top five, number four on the charts, if you will? Of course, he is certainly, uh, in the back of his mind, the Sabbath being the most staple of all laws in the first century in Judaism would certainly be what he's talking about. He would not be saying that I'm going to upheld the law, but I'm going to break the Sabbath, and he would not be upholding the law. Peter in Acts chapter 10, this is an interesting one. Peter in Acts chapter 10, remember this is where the four corners sheep comes down and, and, and God tells him, arise Peter, kill and eat. And what's the very first thing out of Peter's mouth? He says, I, I can't do that. These are unclean animals. I have never had anything unclean touch my lips. Now we fly right on past there, but look at the significance of this. This is at least 10 years after the death of Yeshua the Messiah. Ten years. And Peter still has not eaten one single ham sandwich or pork chop. I find this incredibly significant. Because if he didn't get the memo on the dietary laws, and he's still keeping the dietary laws, isn't it a safe assumption that the dietary laws who don't make the top ten, that he certainly... Peter is keeping the Sabbath every single week. It would make no sense that he's not eating unclean animals, but he's breaking the Sabbath? Of course not. He is definitely keeping the rest of the law uh, because we're seeing an example of that right here. And so this is a very, a very big proof, to be quite honest with you, that Peter is not breaking the law, and we're talking a decade after the Messiah died. Certainly, if there was some doing away with, out of all the time spent with Yeshua, don't you think that they would have had some inclination that he would be doing away with something and they, they could now do different things that they wanted to do? They didn't get that inclination because there was no inclination from the Messiah. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John in the book of Revelation says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So the question is, John is said to be the most Jewish of all the disciples. Now look, there's only two days in all of the Bible that are called the Lord's Day. And that is the Sabbath and the day that the Messiah comes back to judge the, na the nations. You see, one of the things that we have to remember when the New Testament was being written, when they were writing these, there was no New Testament. There was no canonization of the New Testament. Most of it didn't get written for 60 years. 40 to 60 years after the Messiah died that these letters start to circulate and become canonized. And even some of them, 100 years after that. And so when Timothy is writing, he says, All scripture is God and worthy for reproof and doctrine and correction in the way of righteousness. The only scripture that he's referring to is the Torah and the prophets. The Old Testament. It's the only scripture that exists. And what I call them in our ministries, I call them the dictionary. It's the only dictionary that they had. So when John, the most Jewish of all the disciples, says the Lord's day, he is talking about... He can only be using the definition that he's used to. And the only time the word Lord's Day or Day of the Lord is used in all the Hebrew Scriptures is talking about the Sabbath and when Messiah comes back, the Day of the Lord. And don't you find it interesting that the day that he says this in Revelation, when he says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, the very next uh, thought that comes out of that chapter is that he hears a voice at the sound of a trumpet, and the Messiah is coming back on the Feast of Trumpets, which is called the Lord's Day. I don't think it's coincidence. I think it is very likely that either it's on, on the seventh day, the Saturday, that he is uh, on the Lord's Day, or that he's actually been transported to the Day of the Lord when the Messiah comes back. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 2, it says, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. We see the same exact message again. In Genesis, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and light. If you love me, you'll do that law. It's, he, he says he chose Abraham because he kept the decrees, the ordinances, the commandments, and the instructions long before they were ever written down. Yeshua says the same thing. He says, if you want to enter into eternal life, keep my commandments. John says you love Yahweh, you will keep his commandments. It's the only way to prove that you do love him. 
is if you keep his commandments. As a matter of fact, he even goes beyond that into the 21st century in our thought process. And he says, by the way, you American Christians, that I, I know you're going to be there someday. His commandments are not burdensome. Don't let anybody lie to you. They're not burdensome. You've just never taught them. You've been taught that they're grievous. But if you keep them through faith, they will bless the socks off of you. And that they have done for me for sure. If we're able to believe most of Christianity, we don't have to keep the Sabbath of the Bible because it's not specifically recommanded in the New Testament, then how do we interpret John here when he says to keep the commandments of Yahweh when there's no New Testament at the time to look through? Ladies and gentlemen, I am here to suggest to you that, he, that the commandments of the first century are the same commandments of the very first century when Yahweh started out, and they're the same very commandments here today that we need to take a look at these things and make sure that whatever commandments we're keeping, that that's where our love is. Are we keeping the commandments of the doctrines of men? Are we doing things just because of tradition? Or are we doing things because that's what the Bible said to do? So let's keep going. Saints, keep the Sabbath. In Revelation 14, 12, it says this, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Yahweh and hold to the testimony. Yeshua. This is really important because really what, we're, what he's saying here is he's saying that those that are in the book of Revelation, the great tribulation, the beast aft, actually goes after those who keep the commandments of Yahweh and hold the testimony of Yeshua. Not just those that believe in Jesus, but those who keep the commandments. Why? Because we've already determined that that's how we show that we love him. True love is doing what your father asks you to do and I would even submit, based on my upbringing, the first time. The commandments of God clearly include the fourth commandment of honoring the Sabbath on the seventh day. Now, let's get into what I know everyone's favorite part is, what you've been waiting for this entire time, is, Jim, what about Romans chapter 14, 5? Well, let's work through some of these verses. 14, 5 says this, One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Is this what the author is saying? Is the author saying that literally, is Paul saying that out of one stroke of his mouth, he says, I uphold the law, I keep the law, and Timothy's perfect and it's good and it's worthy for all doctrine, and then all of a sudden Paul switches gears literally 11 chapters later, he says, the Sabbath really doesn't matter. You can choose any day you want. Are we to really believe that Rabbi Shaul, who studied under, studied under Gamaliel, had the, most of the entire Old Testament memorized word for word, is telling us, as a Jewish former rabbi, we can do whatever we want, we can choose whatever day we want? I suggest there's another meaning here, and we're reading into the text. Let's look. Verse 6 says, He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to Yahweh. Now, here's what's interesting. Is that if you look at this from a very careful point of view, you're going to see the very beginning of Romans chapter 14 is all about food. Interestingly enough, it says to he who is, is, uh, is a strong believer, he decides that he can eat meat that's, that's off the idols. He who is weak in the faith only each eats vegetables because he's not sure if the meat uh, is from, uh, from, from, sacrifice, from the sacrificial system or not. Pagans. So that, that whole context of food is carried down through Romans chapter 14, and we get to an interesting verse that I want you to read a different way. I want you to read it as if the entire context is exactly what it is, all about food. Let's read it again. One man considers one day more sacred than another, another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards that day special does so to the Lord. He who eats, eats to the Lord. Now think about this, what I just said. He who considers one day special, let him do to the Lord. And, and he who eats, which is saying that the one that says that this day is special, is not eating. And a matter of fact, history bears this. We know that there was a huge debate in the first century about fasting and which day to fast on. You had some groups that fasted on one day and another group that fasted on another day. And so in the midst of the topic of whether or not it's okay to eat and 
animals that have been sacrificed to idols, and how does that work out and play out when you go over to somebody's house to eat and you don't know where meat came from? As long as it's clean, it's not saying that you can eat unclean animals, it's, it's talking about a meat sacrificed to idols. In the same context of talking about food, does it not make sense that he would address fasting? And he says, listen, guys, you guys keep getting focused on, uh, you're making mountains of molehills. If you think that Tuesday is okay to uh, fast, you think it's Thursday, you each consider whatever day. Scriptures do not tell us which day to fast. So you eat meat on this day, you don't eat meat on this day. It's completely up to you. Certainly, Paul the Apostle is not advocating that anyone can choose any day that you want. And the proof of this is this, that this interpretation is correct, is that Paul would have been strung up by his heels if he was telling all of the people that you can break the Sabbath. They had already brought him and drug, drug him into the courts on false accusations earlier in Romans and in Acts. Now we are led to believe that he, he is advocating clearly breaking the most staple law of all of Judaism and no one even bats an eye. There's no debate. There's no first century uh, historians that are telling us that there was a huge debate or anything like that. No. There was no debate because that's not what Paul meant, and his, his readers and his listeners knew that.